The dominant explanation of the genocide is essentially that elites, the political parties, the power holders, had a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. They felt threatened both by the invasion of the FPR and by the whole movement for democracy and multipartism and elections, real elections, which obviously would have a fair chance of them losing power. And that they whipped up this radical version of ethnicity, this extremism, this anger and this hate, hatred to essentially be able to maintain their own power over time. And uh, that argument is not incorrect. They did that, and I think many of them did it quite deliberately. I also think, by the way, that they frankly believe their own arguments to some extent, but that doesn't take away they used ethnicity, radicalism, violence, insecurity, and fear as deliberate tools to maintain their power, yes. They sort of sowed the seeds of ethnic hatred, yes. But the big problem is, you have to understand something about the soil in which those seeds fell. And it is not enough to say simply that elites sowed the seeds of hatred. You have to understand why the soil was so fertile to those seeds to grow to those plants so rapidly. And let me now stop with that image. And this is not so obvious. So one, for example, of the common and I think excessively simple explanations of the Rwandan genocide is that the Rwandans are obedient. They do what they're told to do. And in that case, indeed, if the elites tell you people X or Y, those people ought to be punished, if not entirely killed, then presumably if we are all obedient, then we would do that. But it bothers me because the Rwandans spend an enormous amount of their time not doing what their elites tell them to do. That's one of their favorite hobbies. <laughs> you know, in like in any of these strong states, and Rwanda has a strong state, it has now and it did before the genocide. You know, there are always people out there seeking to tax, for example, ordinary people, right? The little bike driver, the, the little sewing machine uh, person, and they're doing everything they can not to pay taxes. They evade, they move, they lie. They don't listen, but when they're told to pay taxes, they don't do it. Um, they're told to work for the public good. Once a week they have to come together and rebuild roads and so on. The biggest problem in Rwanda was that nobody was showing up. Nobody came to the darn things if they could possibly avoid it. The only ones who came were those in a position of power who had to, they were obliged to because it was their job. But 90% of the others never showed up. Um, in so many ways, uh, projects would plant eucalyptus trees uh, as, as anti-erosive measures, but the farmers hate eucalyptus trees because they take out an enormous amount of nutrients from the soil. Um, and at night, the farmers would come and rip them out again. So if people constantly are not doing what the state and the elites are telling them to do, then when they're told to kill and they actually kill, it needs more than an explanation that says, well, they were told to. So I believe we need to understand way more than, than just they were told to. We need to understand the fertile soil. And to do that, we've got to go back beyond 2000, uh, 19, 1990, I mean, right? We have to go back in time and understand the society. And as part of that, I essentially developed two parts. One is a part of history, certain myths and images that were um, legible to people, that they could understand. Um, and even if maybe their purchase had decreased a bit in daily life, nonetheless these were images that we can all quite easily come back to. So that's the historical part, we discussed it earlier. But another part, I thought, is indeed what I eventually termed in a sort of a synthetic term, structural violence. Now, I did not develop the term structural violence. It exists since 1964 or so. And the father of the term is a phenomenal social scientist named Johann Galtung. He is the father, actually, of peace studies um, and, and a, an extremely influential, very progressive social scientist. He asked, what is violence? And violence, he defined, as when you forcibly reduce people's actual below their potential. So, for example, if I now strangle you, and I actually kill you, then I dramatically reduce your actual below your potential, right? Because being dead, you will have no more actual, uh, actual left at all. If I imprison you, or somehow constrain you from moving around, I dramatically reduce your ac uh, actual realizations compared to your potential ones too. It's a sort of a different definition of violence, but it's interesting. Because if you look at it that way, if you define violence that way, 
then suddenly it becomes clear that there can be a lot of things that decrease people's actual realizations far below their potential ones. For example, gender roles can do that or racist values that keep certain people down and that they may have even interiorized and in which their potentials are great, they are smart, they are dynamic, they have it in them, but they never given the chance to live up to that. And he used the term structural violence to, for example, argue that in a society, say, where infant mortality could be very low, like it is in this country now around seven or so, Actually, it's higher, but if it's seven per thousand. If in a society, one particular group, a minority group, has an infant mortality of 50 or 100, and there are many countries in the world where this is the case, would that not count as violence? Sure, you saw nobody going around strangling each individual child or shooting each individual mother, indeed. And so we tend not to define it as violence. But the effect, the violence inherent in that structure is the exact same. Thousands of people died needlessly when it was not necessary. Their realizations were below their potentials. And if you do that, then basically the term structural violence tries to tell you something about extreme inequalities in life chances. Frequently those are backed up by values that are um, disempowering and, and, and by, by structures that reproduce the privileges of those on top and maintain the limitations on those on the bottom. And so I argue that in Rwanda, in many ways, society does function that way as well. Do notice, this is not between Hutu and Tutsi. This is between those in power and those not in power, who are Hutu and Tutsi, those not in power. 99% of the Hutu weren't in power either. Eh? And, and, so, and what I do argue is that in a society like Rwanda's, characterized by great structural violence, there is an enormous anger within those societies. And not only in Rwanda, there are unfortunately many other such societies too. There's a great anger. And this anger often, in many situations, doesn't take itself out against the top dogs, against the elites, against the leaders. It tends to take itself out often against the scapegoat group, who can be blamed for the problems. Especially if those from above precisely present a convenient scapegoat to, um, to take it out on. And so my argument was in part that there was that this fertility of the soil, which I earlier discussed, was rendered in part fertile by precisely structural violence.